and welcome back to the channel. In this video I've got seven hints and tips for you for working in a small home studio with macro photography. Some of the tips and techniques here you just won't believe. They are so so simple and pretty much anyone can do these kind of things. We're looking at this seed head and components of it and looking to create something that would be very pleased to print and hang on a wall. Now, one of the things you need to note is if you are interested in macro photography, this video is specifically about working in a small home studio. These techniques will not apply terribly well if you go outside trying to shoot bugs and, and such. We have a controlled environment, which is important to the kind of photography we are trying to achieve here. So macro photography is all about getting in close, getting in to see the detail in what it is that you're trying to take a photo of. And it can be absolutely anything. Typically we think of macro photography with flowers and insects, but it really can be anything that's got some really intricate detail that really stands out when you get in close. Now true macro photography kind of comes in when we're talking about one to one reproduction ratio. And for that, what I've been using is my Olympus M Zuiko 60mm macro lens with my Olympus EM1 Mark II camera, which is perfectly suited to macro photography because it has in-body focus stacking. That allows the camera to create a number of photos at different focal points and then merges them all in the camera itself and then spits that out as a JPEG. We'll start by showing you the subject that we've been photographing, which is this wonderful seed head, which is from a goat's beard plant. You can see it's very much like a dandelion, but much, much larger, structurally more uh, strong. It's uh, quite stable. This has been off the plant as a cutting now for probably about four days and it's only really beginning to shed a couple of little um, seeds from within it. So it's incredibly stable and thankfully there's one or two left in the garden. And you can see that each seed just there is designed by Mother Nature to be carried away on the slightest breeze taken away from the mother plant and deposited in a new location. It is a truly gorgeous thing. Now if you've ever worked in a photographic studio, perhaps a film studio, you will appreciate that everything that is in front of the lens is to a degree make-believe. This is the setup I've been using to hold this seed head just a piece of cardboard with a score there so I can get a, a fold, a piece of black paper glued onto it, a tiny hole in there and the seed popped in. Now the seed weighs absolutely nothing so it's simply in there uh, with a bit of friction because the camera is so tight onto this you don't see any of this messy bit of cardboard around the edge you just see the black background and the seed and that's all we need. It's very, very, very simple. In order to hold this upright, I've got these two folds in it. One I've scored, one I haven't. The one I scored, I use as a base, so I sit it on the table. It wants to fall over if I do that. Easy solution. Small clamp. There you go. It sits up quite nicely. To get some of the shots of this, um, in fact most of them in actual fact, have been shot in the glass. And you see I've got a little bit of gluey blue tack type stuff on the edge there to hold it upright uh, in there. And that works quite nicely, but it's still not quite square. That's not terribly important. Because I've got no horizon reference point in the photograph, I can rotate the camera ever so slightly to take out the angle of that and make it appear straight and now a word from our sponsor me could you please click on the like button it would really help me out and it will push the video out to more people on youtube 
Thank you very much. Now, if you're used to shooting things at distance, landscapes, you know, faces, whatever, you will have an appreciation, I would hope, uh, for the way in which your aperture affects the depth of field. If you're shooting outdoors, you've got enough light, uh, you might be using anything up to a kind of f16 perhaps to get depth, although most lenses start getting some diffraction in much above f11 and the diffraction has the effect of actually softening an image it might get more depth of focus but it actually starts to soften the focal points on the image and when we're doing macro of course we do not want to soften the image we want everything as much as possible to be crispy and sharp it has to be tack sharp so therefore what we don't really want to use is a very small aperture. The lens that I've been using will go down to f22 but it gets very very soft at much above f8. It will thankfully open up to f2.8 so we can let quite a lot of light in. Now it's a very strange way of thinking about this because really what we need to do is let as much light in as possible but of course that reduces our depth of field and as we get closer to something our depth of field reduces greatly in any case but what we absolutely have to understand is when we're shooting macro we cannot go too hard on that aperture because it will soften the image far far earlier than something that you are perhaps used to and there's a simple way of looking at the aperture which is to say that if you are running at a one-to-one -one magnification rate you are doubling the effective aperture so for a example if you're shooting at f8 the actual effective aperture is f16 if you're going to a two to one reproduction rate that gets worse your effective aperture is a three times factor on it so an f8 aperture is an effective aperture of f22 so we need to keep that aperture as open as possible whilst obviously trying to get as much depth as possible now in the example of this item here it's oh crikey two and a half inches across so we've got a lot of depth to try and get into that before losing it and really trying to get all of that detail in so that's quite a challenge even when shooting this tiny tiny seed there's a reasonable amount of depth just from the edge of the front to the stem and when we're talking about shooting in macro though that depth which is or oh, let's let's estimate that at being less than a centimeter still has to be taken into account and this is why we use focus stacking and focus stacking is to take a number of shots at different focal points throughout the frame and then merging them together to get one image that has the depth that we require and I'll show you a few shots in a moment and put them up side by side that demonstrate how your aperture really has an effect on these images with relation to diffraction so we'll start with this image which is shot at f2.8 which is the widest aperture of this lens bear in mind that this is a 15 shot in camera focus stack if we were to do this natively very little of this would be in focus but even so you can see around the bottom right hand edge of this shot we fall out of focus quite a bit if we now look at the f5.6 aperture shot again a 15 shot in camera focus stack it's pretty much pin sharp all the way through as we move on to the f8 aperture focus stack again everything's pretty clear but we're actually now beginning to really notice the hole in the cardboard at the back of the mount for this seed you might only notice it at 100 percent magnification but it's there and now i've shown it to you you can't unsee it sharpness yeah it's again it's pretty good but the 5.6 is probably a bit better as we move on to the f16 aperture shot again a focus stack 
but the diffraction has really kicked in and we're no longer seeing it as sharp as before particularly in the very center and finally on the f22 it's really not that sharp throughout because diffraction has played its part and ruined the shot so let's put them all up side by side. I appreciate it's difficult to see the difference when they're at this magnification. And if you're looking at this on a phone screen, forget it. But there's a clear difference on a reasonable size screen between the F22 and the F5.6. Often when we're doing macro photography, we are advised to use flash. And one of the reasons for using flash is so you can get a good fast shutter speed and you can freeze the action so for, you know, if you're shooting a bug or something out in the garden obviously it's alive or you'd hope it's alive uh, and it might be moving and such and the flash will help freeze any of that movement and create an image we're not looking at freezing movement whilst we're in the studio here because i'm shooting something that is technically alive i suppose but static it doesn't have its own ability to just spring out of the uh, the set and uh, and disappear off so we're just using constant lighting now constant lighting allows me to be a little bit more creative I don't have to set up the flash heads and such and, and generally speaking if you're looking at using large studio flashes and I've got a couple of small studio flashes but generally speaking you don't want them too close to your subject because they're big and powerful things so too close it's just going to burn it out by using these kind of little things i can get them very very close and i can position them really accurately so i can illuminate the subjects and not the background for instance i can place them at angles so where certain parts of the subjects are illuminated and other parts aren't although of course it's quite a big flat um light source so yeah there's only a certain amount I can do with that but this particular item that we're lighting here does catch the light in a quite an iridescent way as you move the light around it so you can be quite creative in which parts of the seed head and parts of the seed are actually illuminated so I'm using a variety of lights uh, I've got this lovely little softbox type thing if I turn it on you'll get blinded by it um, it's by color got quite a lot of control and put this very close I've also got a large LED panel light which I'm suspending right above the item and again quite close and that's given me a lovely soft top-down light hardly any shadow coming off it it's really nice even really close it works very well and I've got a couple of other LED panel lights that I'm getting quite close that I'm using for various illumination techniques and such and obviously I'm shooting quite a lot of variations in this to get the look that I'm after. Not everybody of course is going to have these lights. I could just so easily use the window light from the Velux window above the uh, photography table. I don't get quite so much control out of that and I've got the light and therefore I'm using it but if you don't have one you can get away without it you just need a good soft light source if we look at camera support if you were to be shooting outdoors with macro you probably wouldn't want to use a tripod because it's gonna get in the way everything is moving and therefore keeping your camera static is probably not the greatest idea you need to be dynamic with it that's very different from where we are here in the studio whereas everything remains in place therefore a tripod is not only useful it's absolutely essential and one of the reasons it's essential is because we don't actually have that much light and not having a great deal of light means that we need a longer shutter speed and in order to make sure that everything stays exactly where you put it no camera shake you need to make sure that the camera is lovely and stable and one of the other things that comes in with that is perhaps to use the camera's shutter timer or perhaps use a remote release to ensure that you're not joggling the camera at the point that you are pressing and releasing the shutter and there's another reason we need a tripod because we're focus stacking we need to ensure that there's no movement between frames 
we will create blur otherwise. So we've just really brushed upon the shutter speed issue. Bearing in mind that we're keeping the camera aperture relatively open at perhaps 5.6 or perhaps f8 and a maximum of f11 on most macro lenses I suppose. We're still working with not a lot of light so we do have to have a slow shutter speed to get everything in. Now that's not an issue in the studio so long as you haven't got someone trampolining over there. But it's something you do need to bear in mind. Unless you're using flash you've got to get the shutter speed down to get the light through to the sensor and therefore a camera support and a slow shutter speed are essential here. So let's talk about focusing. In macro photography one of the tricks and techniques is to not move the focus point particularly and it's one of the reasons actually why setting the focus to manual is really really useful in many cases. What you try to do is actually move the camera or the subject. Now given that we've got the camera on a tripod here we don't want to be going around faffing around moving the camera and the tripod because that's completely unnecessary. What you want to do is get the camera in position and then move the subject because the subject isn't going to move on its own it's not alive in the sense that it's just going to get up and walk off it's so so much simpler than having to undo your lock screws and everything else and then just move it around that little bit move the subject it's so so much easier and so much more precision as well this kind of macro doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one reproduction what you've been looking at with this seed head is probably more like a one to 1.4 reproduction because if I go in too close I am in too close I need to be ooh, about six to eight inches away from something with this lens to get in and do a one-to-one -one reproduction and if I do that I'm just too close to it I see hardly any of the actual item itself what I really want to do is get the whole item in the shot and in order to achieve that I'm having to pull the camera further away from the subject more and therefore not achieving one-to-one -one, which is absolutely fine we're still getting the detail that we want in this and it still looks awesome Well, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope that uh, you've got something useful out of this. If you have, please, please click that like button. It helps the channel so, so much. If you uh, have really got something out of it, you can buy me a coffee. There's a link below. Have a look at my website where I will soon be having prints available for sale as well. Take care, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.